Last week, uh, we began a study of this psalm, of Psalm 33, uh, which is a psalm of praise. It's a psalm that, that invites us and commands us to praise the Lord. And then it gives us reasons why we should praise God. It explains who God is in relation to us. And so that is what we are going to continue to study this week. I said last week it would be a two-part sermon, and that is the case. Uh, Because we moved the Lord's Supper to the morning worship today, that means our our service may extend a little bit longer than than we are accustomed to, but I trust that that will not bother anyone. I want also to remind you that as we reread Psalm 33, uh, we, we are seeing that The way in which God is described to us in this psalm is by telling us about who God is in relation to us. So we talked last last week about God's relative attributes. We attribute to God a name or a title that explains a relation that we have to God or a way in which God relates uh, creation to himself. So Psalm 33 calls us to praise for who God is, especially who God is in relation to us, and then we will see how we ought to view ourselves and respond to this uh, as a result. So let's read Psalm 33, and then we'll pick up where we left off last week. Psalm 33, this is the word of God. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Four, now here are the reasons. Because the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashioned the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Amen. Last week, to begin our outline, we looked at three things in particular, and we saw that God is our creator and our judge, and we saw that God is our supreme Lord and he is our governor. So we've seen four titles given to God already, creator, judge, supreme Lord, and governor. God being our creator, is its meaning is obvious. God being our judge, its meaning is obvious. Supreme Lord, we meant that he has authority over all that he has made. And when we spoke about God as our governor, we means that he guides all things. He, he brings them to his appointed ends. He frustrates the counsel of the nations, but his counsel stands forever. And so if you continue the outline from last week, we would be moving on to point four now, because point one was that God is triune. So here we're going to look at two more points, talking about God's titles or relative attributes, and then the rest of the sermon will deal with our response uh, to who God is in relation to us. 
So however you want to take notes, that's fine. You can think of two points right now, or you can think point four and five as continuing from last week. We see now that God is our redeemer. God is our redeemer. And here we are focusing on verses 16 through 19. God is our redeemer. Have you ever been on a sports team that had a really good player on it? Every team has one, one child or one player who's better than the rest, a best player. But some teams have a player who's not just the best on that team. They're the best of all the teams in the league, a, a true star player. Have you ever been on a team like that where you had that one kid who could just destroy everybody else? Or perhaps your, your child was on a team like that, a boy or girl, uh, Owen's first year in, in the La Mirada Soccer League was like this, where his team actually had two of those really good players. And since those soccer leagues are determined by age, it was also the case where they were at the oldest possible point in the league or in the division. And by the end of that season, they, were, they would have really been in the next one. So they were the oldest kids. They were the best kids. And his team won the championship that year. Uh, because they really just destroyed everybody else. Well, we love it when that happens. If you're on that team, you think it's great. Or if your sports team that you really love has some superstar player, you also get excited about that. He's on our team. Wow, we have Michael Jordan or we have Wayne Gretzky. You know, that, that person who is statistically just that much higher than everyone else, you get excited. They're one of us. You may even have a sense of, of pride and you say to other sports teams fans well we have so and so you know we have Messi or or whoever it might be we know what that's like well here's another case that's similar to that we as Americans we take pride in our military we're very proud of it in fact Uh, we have a very strong military with many branches who can do many different things and it's, it's funny to think about the fact that some countries don't have a military. Uh, if you look at their armed forces, they just have transport and relief uh, divisions, but they have no offensive capabilities. They have no combat planes, no combat vessels, no combat vehicles. For example, New Zealand. New Zealand has no navy. New Zealand has no air force. They don't have any fighters. They don't have any bombers. They don't have any destroyers, etc. So if the United States wanted to conquer New Zealand, what would it take? All it would take is just deciding to do it. Just one day the United States would say, let's take New Zealand because we'd like to have Middle Earth. And you just do it. That's all it would take. You would now own uh, Hobbiton. It sounds like a good idea, actually. Why would we have that confidence? Because we'd think, we've got all the big stuff. They don't have any of it. So there we go. In fact, the more you learn about our military capabilities, the more astounding and and scary it gets about what you can do. Uh, It's pretty amazing. Well, what does Psalm 33 say to us? What does Psalm 33 say to warlike Americans who take pride in military? Look at verses 16 to 19 with me again. Psalm 33 says, The king is not saved by his great army. The warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. These are interesting statements because in the ancient world, this is a list of your best wartime assets. Horses and valiant men are your best weapons of warfare. The horse was the premier and strongest weapon of war at that time. I suppose you could get elephants, but there weren't many of those and not in many places. Horses were the most important because you could attach, not only could you have horsemen, but you could attach a horse to a chariot, and chariots are essentially the tanks of the ancient world. And so the author, the psalmist, is saying the best and biggest military in the ancient world in their time cannot save, cannot deliver, cannot give victory. Where does victory come from then for Israel? Where does wartime prevailing, where does, what is its source for the kingdom of Israel? 
the psalmist tells us in the subsequent verses, in verses 18 and 19. We see that it is the eye of the Lord on those who fear him. It is the eye of the Lord on those who hope in his steadfast love. He delivers them. God is the source of their deliverance. God is the one who keeps them alive in famine. And so we say that God is our redeemer, or God is our deliverer. In times of trouble, in times of danger, in times of difficulty, ultimately we look to God to deliver us from these things. However much we use means to try to deliver ourselves, we look to God to bless those means. Now, this mindset of armies do not win by strength alone, but by God's blessing, can you think of someone who really lived by that, whose mind was very much in line with these truths? Well, it's the King David, isn't it? If you have your your Bibles, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17 with me. 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is David's encounter with Goliath. And what what happened in in that case? You have two armies who face off against each other, and they say, you know what, let's have our champions fight. Let's have our best player go out there. Let's have our strongest uh, war machine pitted against your strongest war machine. And whoever wins in this one-on-one combat, the whole battle will be decided uh, through these two. And so, of course, Goliath, a gigantic man, goes out on behalf of the Philistine army, And he has full armor, he has multiple weapons, and he's just a huge, powerful man. And David goes out without armor, with only stones and a sling, and faces off against Goliath. Why would David do this? Did David expect Goliath to just fall over dead for any reason? No, David's going to fight him. David's going to use means. But why does David go out to battle confidently? Well, we read in verses 45 through 47, why? 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47. Then David said to the Philistine, they won't even name him, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. You see here, the same mindset in David that we find in Psalm 33. The king is not delivered by his great army. The warrior is not delivered by his great strength. Rather, they are all delivered by the Lord whose eye is upon those who fear him and hope in him. Now, how do we connect this to ourselves? How do we apply this to us? We are not the kingdom of Israel. We are not the nation of Israel. And so we cannot necessarily or immediately appeal to the same relationship. Uh, our, our president, whoever that may be at any point in our history, is not favored by God to win any battles. When we, if we send our armies to fight New Zealand <laughs> or just to take it, we don't go with an expectation God will give us victory. We don't have that kind of confidence because God has not made a covenant relationship with our president the way that God had made a covenant relationship with the king of Israel, David and his line. So how does this apply to us? Well, it applies to us in the general sense that God does indeed help his people. He does indeed deliver us in times of difficulty and disaster. We know that God delivers us, and yet we know that there's something far greater than merely general deliverance. We know that God has saved us from a greater enemy than Goliath, hasn't he? God has saved us and redeemed us and delivered us from a greater threat than a javelin or a sword. What has God saved us from? 
God has saved us from our sins. God has saved us from the condemnation that our sins deserve. God has saved us from the eternal suffering of hell. And how did he do this? He sent out that great warrior on our behalf, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who through his incarnation, his life of obedience, and his death delivered our souls from everlasting torment. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God became our Redeemer. Now, if we get a sense of confidence and pride in that best star player on our team, or if we get a sense of confidence and pride in our great military machines and might, should we not have a sense of confidence and pride when our Redeemer, our Deliverer, is Jesus Christ, God himself? Is not Jesus called Almighty God in Isaiah, El Gabor, the mighty warrior God? And is there any being comparable to our God? Is there any being comparable to our deliverer, brothers and sisters? Can anyone face off against our God and prevail? Can any force overpower him? Can any person or any entity or any being possibly go toe-to-toe with our Redeemer, our God? No, because our Redeemer is also our Creator and our judge, and our supreme Lord, and our governor, the one who made, the one who oversees all things. If God is for us as our Redeemer, who can be against us? And who can snatch us out of his hand? Who can separate us from his love for us in Christ Jesus? Who can undo his promises? Who can undo Christ's perfect work? Who can unravel his righteousness? Brothers and sisters, it is such wonderful good news that God is our Redeemer. We look at our works, we look at our righteousness, and we confess it to be filthy rags. Our righteousness is truly unrighteousness in comparison with God's holy law. Our good works are bad works in comparison with God's holy law. We find ourselves to be sinful when we look at ourselves. But God is our Redeemer. He takes us by the hand and leads us out of darkness and into life. He picks us up in our weakness and carries us home. He paid our debts. He drank the cup of our suffering to the dregs. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And so we can say with the psalmist, we are not saved by our great army. We are not delivered by our great strength. The war horse is a false hope for our salvation. Our best efforts are a false hope for our salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. However righteous we may try to be, we cannot deliver ourselves. Salvation, deliverance, salvation again, rescue. These are the words of verses 16 and 17. And we are told, you cannot do this. You cannot bring it about. Who can? What wonderful good news the gospel is that it is the Lord who delivers those who fear him and who hope in his steadfast love. He delivers our souls from death, the psalmist says. And Jesus Christ, our God, our Redeemer, has done this for us. Does that encourage you to know that your God is your Redeemer, that you are not your Redeemer? That is wonderful. That's the best news And that is what we need to hear to start the year and all throughout the year, every single day, the good news of the gospel that God is our Redeemer. Well, then fifthly, or just secondly, we find that God is our helper and benefactor. God is our helper and benefactor. This brings us to the conclusion of God's titles or relative attributes. God is our creator, our judge, supreme lord, governor, redeemer, helper, and benefactor. And we see these titles in verses 20 to 22, which says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. In verse 20, we're told that God is our help. 
He is our shield. We look to him for relief. We look to him for mercy. We look to him for help in times of need. And we should do so because we trust in his holy name. We trust in him as our helper. If you have a medical emergency, you look for aid in your town or in your county. You look for your firefighters, your policemen, your emergency response. You don't dial the number for Canada's emergency response. You don't dial the number for the UK's emergency response. Why? Because they're not coming. They're not yours. They're not your emergency relief. When you dial 911, you have a confidence that your emergency response team will come and aid you. Well, brothers and sisters, we find that God is our help. God is our shield. And so we ought to go to him and we can go to him for help in time of need. The Psalms are full of this language. Psalm 30, verse 10. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Psalm 54, verse 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. The psalmist and the Psalms are full of an awareness. Who is my helper? From whence does my help come? It is from the Lord. He is my helper. What a blessing to know that the one on whom we call for help is our creator, our supreme Lord, our governor of all things. If you dial 911, they will, by God's common grace, and we thank the Lord for this, they will come and try to help you as fast as they can. But they're, they're limited. Stoplights and traffic and all sorts of things do get in the way. When we call on God for help, he doesn't need anyone's permission. He lacks no power. He is the one who created all things, who governs all things. His plans are not frustrated. The councils of the people are frustrated. His plans remain forever. This psalm told us he rescued us and made us a people for his own heritage. He is a present help. In time of need, the scriptures say. And so we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? In the year 2021, remember, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is our helper. Lastly, God is our benefactor. What's a benefactor? Isn't that a rich person who pays for your expenses so you can work or do whatever you need to do? Uh, Maybe. Uh, The word benefactor, think about the word bene, good or well, and factor, one who makes or does. A factory makes or produces things. A benefactor is someone who does good unto you, who provides good for you. A benefactor is one who blesses you and gives you good things, who does that which is good unto you. Now listen to that definition, the one who does good unto you. What does it mean to do good unto another? That is the definition of love. And so when we call God benefactor, what we're saying is God is our lover. But in English, that's a strange way to speak. It it doesn't make sense to English speakers to say that God is our lover. And so it is better to say, easier to say, God is our benefactor. Because that's the definition of love. When we say God is our helper, we're speaking of his mercy. You don't have to move him to be merciful. Oh, please, won't you help me? Please, won't you help me? You just ask him for help, and he helps from the fullness of his own mercy. So also, God is our benefactor. You don't have to plead with him to love you. God is love. And God loves us. Look at verse 22. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. Even as we hope in you, God's love is a steadfast love. It is a firm and fixed and faithful love. That's why you can hope in it. That's why you you can expect it. Because God's love is not fickle like us. Our love depends on our perception of goodness in another and then deciding to do something about it, to be drawn to them and to help them or to do good to them, etc., etc., etc. That's love as a passion in man. Love in God is a perfection. He is our benefactor. And so we can hope in his steadfast love. He loves us dearly. He loves us faithfully. And his love is abiding. 
God will not turn away from doing good to us, the scriptures promise us. He will not dismiss us. God does not say to us, you again? Really? You know what? I'm done with you. This is how, this is how people are. If God's love were like us, if God's love were like our love, this is how it would work. God would say, listen, I've given you life and all good things. I've given you blessing upon blessing upon blessing. I sent my son to suffer and die for you. I've given you my word clearly in a large book of plentiful promises and commands for you. I've given you breath every day. I've brought you this far. I've forgiven your sins time after time after time after time. I have required of you worship and obedience in all that which is good and holy. And how have you repaid me? You have sinned against me again and again and again and again. You have not worshipped me. When you've worshipped me, you've done so distractedly, not really caring, not really focusing on me. You've never worshipped me in a manner that truly corresponds with the greatness of my glory. You've never really been thankful to me in a manner that corresponds to the greatness of my mercy and grace to you. You've never even come close to being what I deserve. And so I'm done with you. That is how God would be if he loved the way that we love. And we all shudder and say, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Brothers and sisters, God is our benefactor, the one who loves us, who does good to us. He is our helper, who has mercy upon us. He is our, our redeemer who gives us not just common grace, but saving grace. He is our governor who guides all things according to the counsel of his own will. He is our supreme Lord who commands and directs us in holiness. He is our judge who will see that all things are made right and will judge with perfect justice. He is our creator who made us and sustains us. These are the relative attributes of God. When you think of the doctrine of God, don't just think it's some ivory tower abstraction, inaccessible to us, only for those who, whose lives are dedicated to that knowledge. Not so. God is our God in relation to us. This is what he is. He is our creator, our judge, our supreme Lord, our governor, our redeemer, our helper, and our benefactor. If that is who God is in relation to us, who are we in relation to God and how should we respond to him in light of who he is? Well, I want to conclude with six brief points about man in relation to God. Firstly, we are a chosen, blessed, and loved people. We are a chosen, blessed, and loved people. Verse 12 tells us, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That is us, the church. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. He has chosen us in Jesus Christ. We are blessed, therefore, to say that God is our God, our Redeemer. We are a chosen, blessed people. And verse 22, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. We are a loved people. We are chosen, blessed, and loved. Those words define us as God's people, as God's children, as Christ's bride, as the church. Who are we in relation to God in light of who God is in relation to us? We are a chosen, blessed, and loved people. Secondly, how should we respond Joy and gladness. Joy and gladness. Not too long ago in 1 Thessalonians, we looked at Paul's command to rejoice always or at all times. Rejoice. And we talked about how can we do that? Well, we find our source of joy in God who is always good, who is always a blessing to us. And so here the psalmist in verse 1 says, Shout for joy in the Lord. O you righteous. And in verse 21, for our heart is glad in him. We shout for joy in the Lord. Our heart is glad in him.
Do we lack reasons to be joyous? Do we lack a cause for gladness in our lives? We do not, because we rejoice in him, and we are glad in the Lord. And if you, if you need reasons, remember that who we are and how we respond is second. You begin with who God is in relation to us. So why am I joyous and glad? Oh, because he is my creator, he is, he is my judge, he is my supreme lord, he is my governor, he is my redeemer, he is my helper, and he is my benefactor, the one who loves me. I'm joyous. I'm glad in the Lord. Thirdly, this psalm calls us to fear and awe. Fear and awe. When we consider these things, we can ask that question that the scriptures ask, who is like the Lord? Who? Is there one like him? There is not. There is no other. And so if we have been related to this great and exalted and majestic God, how should we respond? With fear and awe. Verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Remember that the fear of the Lord is not terror. It's not horror. It is a reverence. It is an acknowledgement of God's greatness, his otherness, his beyondness. <laughs> he is so much greater than us. To, to fear God is to bow before him, to prostrate yourself and say, I am a creature, an unworthy creature at that, and you are the great and exalted most high one. That is fear. The fear of the Lord is a reverent awe. And so as we have joy and gladness in him, we should also have a reverence, a fear, and an awe before him because of his greatness. He spoke, and it was. And then the psalmist tells us, therefore, be in awe and fear him. He knows all our thoughts, Psalm 33 has told us. He sees all our deeds. Let us fear and have awe before him. Fourthly, Praise and thanksgiving. What does this psalm call us to? To do in relation to God? Praise and thanksgiving. If we are the people of this great God, if we are the people of this creator, judge, lord, governor, redeemer, helper, and benefactor, then praise befits us, Psalm 33 says. Praise befits us. The upright. What does it mean to befit? To befit means to correspond, to rightly match, to belong. For those who are the upright, those who are righteous in God, those whom he has redeemed, it is right, it is fitting, it is appropriate for us to praise God. It, it, it's like saying that praise is the uniform that we ought to wear. You wouldn't expect a Dodgers player to be wearing a Yankees uniform. That would be just awful. That would be just about the worst thing a Dodgers player could ever do, or any baseball team, to wear a Yankees uniform. It would not be fitting. It would not be fitting at all. You'd say, no, a Dodgers player, a, a Dodgers uniform befits a Dodgers player. That's who they are, and so that uniform is appropriate for them. It's fitting for them. If we are the righteous, if we are the upright because of what God has done for us, if God is our creator, judge, Lord, governor, redeemer, helper, and benefactor, what befits us, what appropriately clothes us and defines us and characterizes us, the psalmist says praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving. You, you match things that, well, match. So if you want to run a 100-meter sprint, you're not going to put on a, whole, a, a, a hockey goalie's equipment. Okay, I've got my skates, I've got my pads, I've got my helmet, I've got my, my wrist pads, I've got my stick. Time to run the 100 meters with my ice skates on. Say, that, that doesn't work. You wouldn't go to war with a nail file and you wouldn't file your nails with a sword. That doesn't match, it doesn't correspond. 
so also a saint, a child of God, who doesn't praise God, who doesn't sing God's praises, who does not have God's, does not have praise and thanksgiving on his or her lips, you say that, that's not fitting. That's, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. It is good and right for those who have been saved, those who have been redeemed, those whose God is the Lord, to praise him. Praise befits the upright. Verse 2, give thanks to the Lord. It should be continual and ordinary. Remember how we talked about in 1 Thessalonians that we're not always to rejoice always, but to pray without ceasing? How that means prayer should be a constant diligence. It should be a constant thing in which we participate. So also, praise and thanksgiving don't have to be long and elaborate things. It can be, like we said in that sermon, seeing creation and saying, praise the Lord for that. Hearing good news, praising the Lord for that, thanking the Lord for that. For that. Just say it. Just do it. Just praise the Lord. It is fitting. It is right for you to do so. And if you won't praise the Lord, or you don't thank the Lord, something is severely wrong. Fifthly, fifthly, how should we respond in relation to God? Fifthly, song, shout, and melody. Song, shout, and melody. Verses 1 through 3 say, Shout for joy in the Lord, make melody to him, sing to him a new song, eventually with loud shouts. Now, context is tricky here. Because sometimes I feel like at our church and other churches that I attend, in the UK or in the US, OPC, Reformed Baptist, churches like us, sometimes it's like, don't let anyone know you're singing. Don't let them know. Just sing like this. You don't want anyone to know you're singing, even though that's why we're here, to sing praises to God, even though we're the righteous, in a church with hymnals, don't let anyone know you're singing. No, the psalmist says, shout for joy in the Lord. But we wouldn't want to be charismatic. Hey, 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 shout for joy in the Lord. Maybe you could use a little charisma, okay? Shout for joy. Make melody to him. But I don't have that beautiful singing voice. Who cares? Shout for joy to the Lord. Say hallelujah. But what if no one else does? Shout for joy, make melody, sing. I like to sing as loud as I can, and I don't care what it sounds like. Just sing to the Lord. I encourage you. I don't just encourage you, the scriptures command you. Shout for joy, make melody to him, sing to him with loud shouts, playing skillfully on instruments. Now, one of the reasons why Americans and British are scared of such things is not only the excesses of you know what I'm talking about, the really extreme examples of charismaticism or Pentecostalism, the extreme examples. Not only does that condition us to be afraid of expressing ourselves to God, but there's also our American and British history of revivalism and pietism and great awakenings and such things. And, well, you don't want to micromanage the emotions of people religiously, and that's true. It's a bit more complicated. But what's not complicated is this. Shout for joy in the Lord. Make melody to him. Sing to him a new song with loud shouts. All that really means is when we're singing praises to God, brothers and sisters, sing to him. If I don't know you're singing, if no one else knows you're singing, something's wrong. There's a problem. Just sing. Just sing to the Lord. Don't care what other people sound like because they should also be singing too. It's not about what other people think. It's about praising the Lord our God. Sixthly and lastly, how should we respond? Hope and trust. These two themes, these two words run throughout the psalm, especially in the later verses. Verse 18, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. We should hope in the Lord. Verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord means hoping for him. It means you have confidence that he will provide and you're waiting for that. 
Verse 21, we trust in his holy name. Verse 22, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Hope, waiting, trusting, and again hoping are how we should respond to our creator, our judge, our supreme Lord, our governor, our redeemer, our helper, our benefactor. Is he worthy of our hope? Is he worthy of our trust? Yes. One hundred, a thousand times yes, and a thousand times again yes. Then wait on the Lord. Hope in his steadfast love. Remember, his love is not fickle like ours. It is faithful. It is steadfast. It is permanent. It is perfect. Trust in his holy name. Remember that in the unfolding events of life, the council of the nations is made nothing. It's frustrated. But the plans of the Lord's heart and his counsel stand forever. Remember, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We are a blessed people. Trust in him. Hope in him. Wait upon him. He is our God. He redeemed us. He loves us. And he is in control of all things. He is on our side in Jesus Christ. He is with us in Jesus Christ. And so we will not fear because we are in Jesus Christ. Well, I trust that having looked at God's relative attributes, God in relation to us, or as he has related us to himself, and as we have looked at our responses drawn from this psalm, I trust that you will depart from here with joy and gladness and fear and awe and praise and thanksgiving and songs and shouts and melodies and hope and trust. Those things ought to define us today and every day as God's people. And we can conclude with this prayer. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Amen. Well, it's time to partake of the Lord's Supper, in which God reminds us, I am your Redeemer. My body and my blood are those tokens by which you have access to God. It is in my body and my blood that your sins are. Are forgiven, And so Psalm 33 is a perfect preparation for partaking of the Lord's Supper. When we see who God is in relation to us in the Lord's Supper, we, we remember who we are in relation to him. We are in covenant with him. His covenant with us is to remember our sins no more, founded and established on the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for that. The Apostle Paul said this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. To do so in an unworthy manner means you treat it, treat it as nothing. It's just it's bread and it's wine. It's, it's something we do or whatever. I'll do it because I'm told to. No, that person would partake unworthily and should not partake. It is also eaten in an unworthy manner if we do so in a way that divides the body. If we do so in a way that, that rends the unity of the church, we should not do that either. And so we should be able to come here with union with one another and communion, union with Christ and communion with one another. Paul says, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. By faith in Christ and at peace with the brethren, we join together in this table. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts uh, and then the deacons will direct us in uh, receiving the elements. So just take a moment to settle your heart.